European football in crisis. Some of its biggest clubs have announced a league of their own. Fans and governing bodies say they've betrayed the sport. But what's really behind this move? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohamed Jamjoum. They're some of the biggest names in sport. European football clubs like Manchester United and Real Madrid have become global phenomenons, drawing big-name stars and millions of followers. They're now among 12 elite teams who have announced a breakaway competition of their own called the European Super League. Many fans reacted in anger, while some voiced their support. But the sport's governing bodies say they'll do everything in their power to stop the project, while those behind the new Super League insist the change is necessary. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. First, this report from Neve Barker. Hours after some of the continent's richest clubs threatened to split European football in two, the sports governing body in Europe, UEFA, hit back hard, saying it would expel the club's players from future European championships and World Cups. I cannot stress more strongly at this moment, UEFA and the footballing world stand united against the disgraceful, self-serving proposal we have seen in the last 24 hours from a select few clubs in Europe that are fueled purely by greed above all else. On Sunday night, 12 of the continent's richest clubs revealed plans to form a European Super League, rivaling UEFA's prestigious Champions League. Barcelona, Real Madrid and Atletico have agreed to join in Spain. In Italy, both AC and Inter Milan have signed up alongside Juventus. And six clubs from England's Premier League also want to join. Manchester United, City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal and Tottenham. The managers of the teams have been dodging awkward questions. Let's be honest, I'm an employee of this club and I trust this club. And uh, my job is very clear, so I'm maybe not the right person to ask. I'm just a manager and I'm prepared to coach my players under any circumstances. The plans even prompted this intervention from the British Prime Minister. We're going to look at everything that uh, we can do uh, with the, the football authorities to, to make sure that uh, this doesn't go ahead in the way that it's uh, currently being proposed. So far, no teams from France or Germany, including the current European champions Bayern Munich, plan to join the new league. But three more clubs are expected to sign up, all set to pocket more than $400 million when they do in a project funded by US banking giant JP Morgan. Seriously, in the midst of a pandemic, an economic crisis, football clubs at national league level going bust nearly, furloughing players, clubs on the edge in League One and Two, and these lot are having Zoom calls about breaking away and basically creating more greed. <sighs> Joke. The Super League clubs want to start as soon as possible, but the Premier League, La Liga and Serie A have all joined UEFA in condemning the move. So too have many fans. Competing clubs face being booted out of their domestic leagues. Several television broadcasters are also refusing to abandon UEFA and national leagues to join the new project. But if it does go ahead, football's single sporting pyramid, from the lowest grassroots teams all the way to the top, may never be the same again. Neve Barker, Al Jazeera. Those behind the Super League say they want to kick off as soon as practicable. The competition will have 20 teams. The 15 founding members are guaranteed a place every year. Other clubs will compete for the remaining five spots. As Neve mentioned, each team will earn $400 million just for joining the league. That's nearly three times more than what the Champions League winner gets every year. Organizers say the format guarantees regular matches between the top teams. This potentially means more fans in the stadiums, more television viewers, and more money for the clubs. Revenues have taken a hit during the pandemic. It's predicted that the world's top 20 football clubs lost more than a billion dollars from broadcasting and ticket sales. All right, let's bring in our guests in London. Akhil Vias, an Arsenal fan and board member of the Arsenal Supporters Trust. In Loughborough, UK, Borja Garcia, senior lecturer in sports management and policy at Loughborough University. And in Beirut, Ilya Trajanovic, strategic advisor at Doli Sports, focusing on sports technology. A warm welcome to you all. 
Borja, let me start with you today. This idea uh, of a Super League, while maybe not the exact same thing, but the idea has been discussed for years. Was it the pandemic that pushed it across uh, the line? And, and why, why now? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, indeed, this, uh, this has been around probably since the 90s, and especially the late 90s and around the time of the creation of the Champions League and has followed all of our careers for quite some time. Why right now, I think uh, on the one hand, it's indeed the pandemic. If it's the level of debt that the major clubs have uh, accumulated in the in the last year, and the other uh, the other reason I think that uh, which is very important and is probably far less discussed is the availability of uh, capitalist funds, venture hedge funds, uh, most of them coming actually from the United States who have decided to invest heavily in a sport, not only in football, not only in football, but of course uh, in rugby, in other sports. And now they want to finance this Super League. And I think that probably that is what has uh, moved it over the line. Ilya, uh, UEFA's president described the Super League plan as a spit in the face of football lovers and said that the clubs and players should be banned from all UEFA competitions as soon as possible. What happens next? What kind of impact is this going to have on the rest of the season? I mean, if this becomes a protracted affair, then you could really, you know, be thinking, okay, this is actually a reality. But there's going to be some, you know, legal ramblings around whether or not they could play in these tournaments. But as long as this is kind of nipped in the bud, you know, we have tournaments right, you know, on our doorstep. We have the Euros, which, which as we all know, were were postponed from last year. Uh, Qatar 2022, you know, where we're right around the corner as well. So uh, I think timing is key. Uh, if we let this drag on, then it just gets more serious. Uh, as you said, they want to start ASAP. I think that's another uh, important factor. But speaking of timing as well, um, you know, they said this just as UEFA, as Alexander Chetrin, uh, UEFA's president, was unveiling the, the new Champions League format. Uh, it was to expand the league, uh, I mean, expand the tournament, and also kind of give in to this idea of a Super League. Because as we see in basketball and the Euro League, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a different format. It's not group stages. So the Champions League will change. Football is changing. We all agree with this. But I feel like there was a great miscalculation in, in, in the public mood uh, when this was revealed. Because I would add to what Borja said. I agree with everything he said. But football these days, with the lack of fans uh, who could voice their discontent, voice their happiness usually, but I mean, uh, with VAR and, and, and with uh, you know, the pandemic stopping us from going to games, I feel like they thought this was the, you know, the right time to go in, and uh, it's, it's backfiring. I mean, there's developments every minute, but it looks like it's backfiring. Akhil, Ilya was just talking there about this announcement really backfiring as far as the timing. I, I was looking at your Twitter feed in particular before the show, uh, and I saw many posts about how, as a fan, you were so disappointed uh, in this announcement and, and the possible formation of a Super League. Let me ask you, why has this triggered such a strong response among fans. Because it totally takes away the sporting merit. You know, nobody wants a closed shop. And that's essentially what this is going to do. It's, it's going to mean the same teams playing each other every single year. And that's not what a football fan wants. A football fan wants variety. A football fan wants promotion, relegation, the excitement. You know, by having a European Super League, domestic leagues are going to be weakened. I look at the Premier League. Unless you're going to win it, finishing second or finishing 15th means nothing. Because if you're Arsenal and you finish 15th, you're going to be in the Europa, um, in the European Super League. If you finish second, we're still going to be in there. So what's the incentive of actually playing, you know? And, and you know, if you're a Leicester City fan or a West Ham fan, we've had great seasons this year, and then you're told, even though you finished fourth, you're, now, you're not going to be in this top level of European football, what's the point? So I think it's going to be it's going to result in a lot of meaningless games in the Premier League, um, and ultimately it is going to kill football. So it's absolutely wrong. It's an absolute disgrace, in fact. Borja, Britain has said that they are going to do everything within their power to stop this Super League from happening. They've said that all options are on the table, and that they're even going to discuss ways of potentially penalising the six English clubs that have signed up to the Super League. Can the government of Britain actually accomplish this? Can they actually prevent the Super League from happening? Well, it is, uh, it is difficult. It is, of course, difficult because uh, we should remember that we are in Britain, which is a country which is traditionally very liberal, very business-oriented. 
And it is somehow ironic, it is really, really ironic, not somehow, that it is a conservative government who wants to take a protectionist measure to go against uh, the development of business, uh, especially the development of, of uh, British uh, business, although owned by other countries, uh, when they want to make to take their money away after Brexit. So there is something deliciously ironic about this uh, intention of the conservative government of Boris Johnson. Now the question, can they do it? Well, I think they can, because as a government, of course, uh, they can always uh, regulate. It is within their powers. Then, of course, uh, it has to be done through the, uh, through the parliament. And then, of course, the clubs will always have recourse to the courts, to the different uh, authorities. There is perhaps one aspect that needs to be looked at, which is that we should not forget that, uh, especially the International Olympic Committee and FIFA, FIFA especially, they don't like governments uh, intervening into sport. They really, really don't like it. On the other hand, of course, what FIFA really doesn't like is governments intervening in football affairs when they go against FIFA. If a government is going to decide to intervene in football affairs uh, in favor of FIFA, I think FIFA is going to be far less uh, worried about it. Um, it will take a major intervention. It will take an intervention that I don't think we probably have seen in the United Kingdom. And also it will take an intervention that will contradict uh, a couple of decades of United Kingdom uh, commercial, business, and even a sport policy, but they can do it. Ilya, FIFA had warned in January that any breakaway league would not be recognized by them and that players taking part could be banned potentially from playing in the World Cup. Do you think that's going to happen? And how might this impact the World Cup going forward? Yesterday, I was just waiting for the players to, you know, to speak and, 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 and to hear what they were going to say. And I, I, I feel really bad for them. They're in a position where uh, they can't really... Um, uh, predict their future. And as I said, there's tournaments around the corner. It's going to take uh, a lot of, uh, you know, legal ramifications to see if you, if, if, if FIFA can actually enforce this, and also where, because in sports, uh, it, you know, it usually goes to the court of arbitration for sport, um, and it could take even longer over there. So, uh, as Borja said, uh, it's 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 something where where uh, anything can happen. Uh, the British government. Uh, said yesterday or the day before that even if the FA and, and the bill can't do anything about it, that they will step in. We've heard from royalty. Uh, we've heard from uh, from footballers. They're coming out today um, So and last night. So it'll be interesting to see how things develop. Um, but in the end, uh, as, as, as Borja said, if, if FIFA sees that the government are getting too in the way of, of their decision making, then, then we could roll. Akhil, going forward, do you think that we could see some kind of compromise struck that would be in the interests of both fans and clubs? And if so, what do you think that compromise might look like? I don't know. I mean, that's what people are saying. That is this a, a massive negotiation sort of tactic? Um, is this kind of clubs really taking it that far as a big threat? So then UEFA do compromise we don't know, you know, we don't know. There's so much going on. You talked about government. We, the Arsenal Supporters Trust, were in a meeting with the Premier League and the Football um, Association, a Football Supporters Association this morning with Boris Johnson um, and also the leader of the opposition, Keir Starman. So things are happening. There's lots going on. Is there a compromise? Maybe. And that's what, you know, I think that's what fans would want because the, 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 the European Super League is taking football too far one way. Um, and, and, you know, UEFA and FIFA are not squeaky clean and, and, you know, by no means are fans suddenly thinking they are. But clearly, you know, to have a tournament sort of governed by its founders, the clubs, doesn't quite sound right. So the clubs definitely need more influence when it's UEFA competitions. Um, so we'll, we'll look to see what will happen there. But I hope something will be, will, it will be resolved. Borja, from your perspective, how much does all of this have to do with essentially making uh, more drama uh, for television. I mean, you're talking about big clubs here with big stars playing each other more often, leading to a bigger audience, potential bigger revenue stream from broadcasting rights, right? Yes, from broadcasting, or let's uh, just call it perhaps a little bit more wider commercial rights. You know, it can be TV rights, it can be over internet, OTT operators, but it is about making more money out of, uh, out of professional football. Uh, I like to quote uh, the chairman of the Spanish La Liga, Javier Tebas, who I once uh, heard saying in a conference, our rivals at La Liga are not the Premier League, are not the Bundesliga, our rivals nowadays are Netflix and Amazon Prime. 
professional football sees itself being as part of the entertainment industry for right or for wrong. I'm not going to say this is where they should be, but it is, this is where they look themselves. This is they want to fight uh, for the attention of the people rather than watching Game of Thrones to watch the Champions League, rather than uh, watching any, any the TV news to watch the Champions League. So it is indeed, it is indeed about increasing uh, revenue from that, uh, com from that commercial operation. It is increased about reaching new audiences beyond Europe and in a global market. I'm not so sure it is as much as uh, Real Madrid's chairman Florentino Perez said last night in Spanish television. I'm not so sure it's about reconnecting with the, the, the youth uh, with football. It may well be that they, are, they think they are losing their younger generation spending their money on football. Uh, that's what they may want to do. But certainly, yeah, I would agree. This is certainly about trying to uh, increase those revenues and then also increase the share of those revenues for each uh, specific stakeholder. Ilya, so many people who've expressed anger at the announcement of the Super League have said in one way or another that this is essentially a case of big business ruining football. Now, do you see that as happening? And is this essentially a case of rich clubs getting richer by sharing in the wealth of this, what would be a very insular league, while everyone sort of outside of it is struggling to stay financially viable? Precisely. I think, I think Gary Neville, you know, with, with passion and poignancy, said last night that it's pure greed. And, uh, you know, someone like me, uh, I grew up watching Arsenal, supporting Arsenal, but only because I, I couldn't watch Red Star Belgrade. And then over the years, you know, as, people, as, as the world became more connected, I could watch them. And then five years ago, you know, lo and behold, Red Star was playing Arsenal in the Europa League. I, I had to make a choice. And, and Red Star is my first club. Sorry, Anil. Um, but uh, the past five years, we've been playing in, in, uh, in the Europa League and Champions League. So, you know, to watch this, I, I know that we're probably going to win it. We did win the European Cup in 1991, unlike uh, Atletico Madrid, Tottenham, Man City and Arsenal, who are, who are the core founders or, or founding members of, of, of the Super League. But I do feel that many dreams will be dashed because many, many football enthusiasts around the world, I'm speaking as a fan now, we support a hometown club and maybe one of the international clubs. So what this will do, it'll, it'll, it'll create such a distance between these top clubs like uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Man City, United, and the smaller clubs. I mean, West Ham and Leicester, sure, uh, they're going to be uh, you know, left in the dark. But what about all the other clubs in Europe? Um, I think UEFA, you know, they're no angels, but they're expanding the tournament. Um, they're even creating another tournament for 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 you know, teams that finish fourth or fifth or sixth in their respective leagues. So the product that we have, the Champions League, is a revered product. People love it. Uh, Mesut Ozil said kids, they dream of playing in the Champions League or the World Cup, not in the European Super League. So despite, you know, the melodrama, I think it's warranted. Uh, football is really a global language. Um, I worked for the World Cup committee in Qatar and, um, you know, Usually, the big stories off the pitch had to do with Qatar. Uh, the World Cup taking place in November, for example, went under a lot of scrutiny. But at, at the end of the day, this scheduling conflict will actually see players play in tip-top condition in November and December, as opposed to playing at the end of the season. So there's a silver lining here. I just simply don't find any silver lining if you're a football fan. Akhil, as a football fan, when you boil all this down, does it essentially come down to the question of, who owns football? I mean, doesn't all of this and the discussion around it really highlight a growing disconnect between the big business of sport, the community of sport fans, especially when you're talking about just, you know, kids kicking around a ball and aspiring to be like their football heroes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think we've seen in the last few days who does really own football. And we certainly know at Arsenal how, you know, we don't call them owners. There are investors because they've invested in Arsenal. Um, to essentially make money, you know, we've 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 met them a few once or twice in ten years. We don't hear from them. This week, all of the owners have gone into hiding after announcing their deal. You know, it's because they're ashamed. You know, they're totally ashamed of it. If they weren't ashamed, they will be out there explaining to us why it's it's a good thing. They're not. Um, so, who owns football? You know, it, it's sad, but I mean, what what we've seen in the last year with the pandemic is, you know, football grounds they're soulless without fans you know the tv companies have been trying to pump in fake noise which is also ridiculous um 
to, to replace us. It's, it's going to take more than noise to replace fake noise to replace us. So I think, you know, essentially the, the, the biggest stakeholder in football is fans. And I think the product is far weaker. But we've seen that these owners, you know, that they'll, they'll make decisions, they'll be in other countries, they'll hide. Um, and, you know, they're trying to get away with it. And hopefully we're not going to let them. Borja, what are some of the other challenges that's going to be uh, that the Super League would face? And, and also, could all this basically just fall apart? And if so, is there a way back from it? Well, I think there are a number of challenges. I would say there is one, and probably the most pressing at the moment, is the socio-political challenge. I don't think the organizers of the, uh, of the Super League anticipated the backlash. Uh, I can't think, knowing the people, knowing Florentino Perez, knowing the owners of the City Group, they were ready to fight. They were ready to fight backlash. Uh, they already bullied, for example, UEFA in the Court of Arbitration for a sport. But uh, perhaps they miscalculated a little bit. So the socio-political challenge is one. The other, actually, I think it is going to be the economic, because one thing I'm starting to detect is that the 12 founders, for the moment, for the moment, of course, we have to wait, they are actually having problems inviting other clubs to their competition. They wanted to have three more members, and then they wanted to invite five uh, more in order to make 20. And it seems for the moment they are going to um, either to invite clubs they didn't want to invite or actually to try and do something different. So that is going to be another, uh, another challenge. And finally, of course, I think it is important to talk, uh, and that's rather technical, but we need to mention the legal challenge. Um, under European law, there is a possibility that someone goes to the European court and denounce the 12 founding clubs uh, because they are basically behaving like a cartel. They are basically closing the, foot the professional football market. And there are arguments in favor of that. There are arguments uh, also against that. But I think there is a case that can be made and then there will be a need for a judgment. And actually, that links to the very beginning of the program when we were talking about timing. Of course, if it goes to that, it will drag for years and years, and then perhaps uh, the situation will uh, change. So certainly, we have the social, the socio-political challenge. We have the economic. We have the legal challenge. Mm. And actually, uh, especially in that middle one, uh, failing to convince clubs, uh, I was thinking that actually this morning seems to me actually mm -hmm. the biggest challenge, and the one that may actually. Uh, get things uh, again back in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Ilya, if this actually comes to fruition, if the Super League actually is accomplished, um, do you expect that fans will ultimately follow? I mean, will it eventually get support from fans? Um, personally, I don't. Uh, we were talking earlier about you know the younger generation. Uh, I've worked very closely with 433. They're the biggest uh, you know football social media page. They have over 50 million or 60 million followers on all their platforms and great engagement. Um, and their, their audience demographic is quite young. Um, and most of the comments I've been reading the past 24 hours uh, have indicated that most people are against it. Um, of course, you know, football is the opium of the masses. So uh, it, it might be difficult to say what could happen down the line if it does exist. But I feel that it'll be met with some uh, with you know, with some scrutiny. But in the end, I just don't think, uh, you know, the model can succeed because uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very Americanized. You know, you have the same teams playing against each other. Well, majority of the teams will play against each other every season. And as Jurgen Klopp said, and, 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 you know, others said, who wants to see, for example, Real Madrid against Liverpool every year? It takes away from the game. Uh, there's also a great, great, uh, you know, lack of competition in this, mm -hmm. um, which it could could really you know hurt football uh mm -hmm. you know part of the joy of watching football is is you know having minnows upset a a, a you know big club mm -hmm. or um you know like a relegation battle whereas in the nba or american leagues with a draft system teams can tank you know they could mm -hmm. say we're going to rebuild for the next three years and uh, the drafts don't work out and you know there's there, like this lack of competition could mm -hmm. really hurt the game and if the game is hurt, then I feel the audience will, will, will you know, slow away. All right. We have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Akil Vias, Borja Garcia, and Ilya Trojanovic. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see this and all of our previous programs again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. 
For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.